1975, I joined a Baptist church in Raytown, Missouri, where uh, $2 dollars was a pastor. That's almost 50 years ago. It's kind of weird since I'm only 30. But anyway, $2 dollars is famous nationwide uh, because he wrote books and he had seminars on spiritual. Stewardship, particularly, is the responsible, responsible oversight of the things that God has given us. You know, things like our time, our talents, our treasure. It's the act of being a steward, which means taking care of things that belong to somebody else. And for us as Christians, that someone else, of course, is God. For well, every uh, January, Truman Dollar, he had stewardship month. Church, and he would preach a series of sermons and he would focus, you know, each uh, week on a different topic. He would speak about the being good stewards of our time, of our talents, of our treasures, you know, money and other physical resources. But maybe, maybe he could have added a, a fourth topic on stewardship, a topic that kind of comes to mind when reading verse 25 uh, in our passage this morning. It says that, uh, you know, let's be wise in your own sight. I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. You know, if you read the Bible uh, over and over, uh, there's something notice that there's certain words and certain phrases that, that pop up that seem familiar. You'll remember that, you know, I've seen that somewhere, uh, somewhere else in the Bible before. So let me throw a tip out to you this morning, and there's no extra charge this morning for this tip. A great way to study your Bible is with the Bible concordance. With the Bible concordance, you can find anywhere in the Bible will be a particular word or a phrase that you're looking for, and you can look it up in the strong concordance or whatever uh, concordance you want to use, and you can find it. You can also go online, and you can uh, you know, find it online concordance. But I do prefer... Uh, the old-fashioned way of actually uh, using a book version of the concordance. Right there is a, kind of a blurry uh, picture of the inside of my concordance, where I'm searching for the words that I want to speak about this morning, the words mystery and mysteries. And the reason that I like to use that book form uh, is because you can see all the verses right there at a glance. You just have a short preview of each of the verses and kind of a little brief uh, um, bit about the, the concept of the verse. So, you know, using a concordance is a great way to study the Bible and let the Bible uh, interpret itself. And it's a great way it helps you kind of build confidence and your, your faith will increase in the Word of God because you'll see over and over that there's continuity uh, in the Bible. I got you know, kind of a sloppy uh, red scribble there in PowerPoint, but I wanted to draw that just I just want to draw your attention to you know, a verse that uh, I was looking at in, in, in that word search on um, the word mystery. And in this case, that verse uh, that I'm pointing out there is in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 4. So I look up each of the verses uh, in my Bible, read the whole verse, uh, read it in its context. And then in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1 and 2, we see that um, this is how one should regard us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it's required of stewards that they be found faithful. Now, in regards to stewardship, typically, uh, at least what Tim and Dollar would normally cover if he preached on it, would be, you know, the good topics like being good stewards of our time. And it's important, you know, that we be good stewards and use our time wisely. It's also important that we use our talents and the spiritual gifts, you know, that God uh, enabled us to have and use those uh, as we serve Him. And of course, it's also important that we're good stewards of the, the money that God allows us to have, you know, to further the ministries in our local church. But Paul, he says something here in 1 Corinthians that uh, we can be stewards of the mysteries of God. And that as stewards, we should be found faithful. So I guess my question this morning is, are we all, you know, being good stewards of the mysteries of God? So I'm hopeful that in the message today we'll learn what some of those mysteries of God are found in our Bible and in order to help us, you know, to strive to be better stewards for our Lord. So I'm going to detour from our text quite a bit this morning. 
when I first began to write this message, you know, it had so much expository promise, but it's kind of more, more into a topical message. Uh, but I do want to conclude, you know, come back to verse 25 at the end, uh, which will bring us back off of our detour and into our text. So, that's the introduction. I do have a lot to cover this morning, so I may occasionally have to talk pretty fast at certain points in the message, and I might be going to anywhere to minute with a couple of gossip to 240. But I'll try not to go too far, too fast, and now I'll try to slow it down a bit. But before we do, get into our sermon today, let's pray that God's blessing on our message. Oh, Father, thank you so much for those who are here today. So we do want to pray that um, you bless the message. Uh, just bless uh, me, Lord. You'll help me to be clean and be open to your leading in the sermon, just the uh, tech parts, and help us, Lord, to, to grow and learn more about you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, you might wonder how a message about being a good steward of the mysteries of God would apply to you and to your life. You know, there's obvious uh, applications to good stewardship in those other uh, topics, you know, being good stewards of our time, uh, talents. Uh, you know, it's very obvious how uh, the offering bag and um, giving online, how that uh, applies to our lives, you know, helping the, the local church. Those are very tangible applications. And those elements of stewardship and how they apply to real life, it's not hard to understand those. And I hope that you're all faithful in doing all of those. But being a steward over the mysteries of God, that may make us wonder, you know, is maybe that responsibility of stewardship maybe more for pastors or for elders or Sunday school teachers? You know, you may wonder if it applies only for those who handle and teach the Word of God. But I want to tell you this morning that these mysteries that we're going to look at go for families and for parents, they're for dads who should be the spiritual leaders in the home. And they're for all of us as Christians because we, uh, we should know the truths that are found in the Bible so we can be good examples of those truths and so that we can uh, worship our spirit and in truth. So we need to know them you know, so that we can help the disciple other Christians uh, and, and reach out to the world. And very importantly, these mysteries are for ourselves so that we are properly grounded in solid Bible doctrine. Knowing these truths will help to play a part in putting on the whole armor of God. Um, these mysteries, I'm going to give them in no particular order, but I think a good one to start with is found in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3. It's called the Mystery of Godliness. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. Justified in the Spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. Uh, other versions will read that He was manifest in the flesh, but it's obvious He was He is. But He is our Lord Jesus Christ. We see in John chapter 1, where uh, John is speaking about Jesus, and just as um, we're being shown here in 1 Timothy 3, where it's telling us that Jesus is God. We also see in John chapter 1 where it says that in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. So, since Jesus made everything, and in Genesis chapter 1, the Bible tells us that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, so God made everything. Well, it's not too hard to put two and two together and figure out that God made everything and Jesus made everything. Therefore, Jesus is God. Now, if you're looking for a church to join, then I urge you to find a church that believes certain core beliefs. And if you're in a church that does not have those core beliefs, then I urge you to find yourself a different church. There are certain core beliefs like these. Say, for example, the inherency of the Bible, the blood atonement, salvation by grace through faith in Jesus alone, the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ, the second coming of Christ, the virgin birth, and then the one that we just looked at here uh, in the first ministry, uh, mystery, uh, the deity of Christ and his, uh, his coming in Christ as God, his incarnation. 
Now, I want to tell you that Jesus was not just, you know, 50% man and 50% God, but he was 100% man and 100% God. Jesus was God, born of a virgin, and he became a little baby boy. It's, it's a mystery because, for one, we can't really understand that. And for the second reason, it's a mystery because although elements of that are contained in the Old Testament, it was not really fully revealed to those in the Old Testament. The incarnation and the deity of Christ, you know, what mysterious concepts. I mean, think about that. That showed up as a baby boy. He was a baby, just like any other baby. You know, Luke chapter 2 tells us that he increased in wisdom and in stature. He grew up. Think about that. Jesus, as God, who spoke the world and the heavens into place, he created everything. John tells us that without him was not anything made that was made. And yet, as a human baby boy, Mary had to wipe him and dress him and feed him. Wow, that's a mystery. God became a little baby, just like other babies, but not completely like other babies, because there's no other baby ever born that is God in the flesh. There's no other baby that was ever born of a virgin, and there was no other baby ever born that was born sinless, like Jesus Christ was. In Isaiah chapter 7, it says, Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Now, you know what Emmanuel means, right? It means God with us. Liberal scholars, that, uh, you know, they don't believe in the miracles in the Bible. They don't believe those miracles really happen. They want to tell us that the word for virgin can also be translated handmade. Handmade. And, you know, just any old regular girl. And it is true that Hebrew words can be translated virgin or can be translated handmade. So these little scholars will proclaim that, you know, it's not the virgin birth. Nothing miraculous to see here. But does that really make sense? And that verse, does that really make sense that, that God is going to give us a sign to behold? Okay, here it comes. Here's that, that sign. Are you ready? It's a great sign from God. Behold, a whole maiden, a woman somewhere who's going to have a baby. Really? That's it? No baby? That's the sign? I'm going to have babies everywhere all over the world. No, the sign only makes sense. It is only worth beholding if it's a virgin who's having a baby. And that's exactly what happened. Jesus, the Son of God, was born of a virgin. Her name was Mary. God became a man. I can't explain it, but I believe it. It's a mystery. That these mysteries are true whether we can explain them or not. You need to realize, too, when you let it sink in and believe it. Because there are many, many, many cults and false religions out there that do not believe that Jesus is the Son of God and God in the flesh. God did become a man, a sinless man, so that he could also become the Lamb of God that would take away the sin of the world. In the Old Testament, rounds were slain and their blood was sprinkled over an altar to cover sin. And that was, a, that was a picture of Jesus who had come years later to be saying, playing on that old rugged cross, shedding his blood, not just to cover our sin, but to completely cleanse us. Jesus died to pay for our sin as a free gift if we're willing to repent and to believe and to receive him as our Savior. Like the old hymn says, I will wash in the blood and the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb. Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are your wives in the blood of the Lamb? And that's why John said in John chapter 1, verse 29, the next day he saw Jesus coming toward him, and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. And we find also in Hebrews chapter 9 that it is without the shedding of blood there's no forgiveness of sin. God became a sinless man in order to bear the sin of the world. 
He says his blood is only a human man can do. But not just any blood, his precious, sinless blood. And as God, he also had the power to rise from the dead, and he was victorious over sin and conquered death. Over and over in the Bible, it shows us that the Lord Jesus Christ is God. You remember the story in John chapter 20 about Thomas? You know, he's often called Doubting Thomas. The setting is that Jesus had just risen from the dead and he'd been appearing to various people, but he had not yet appeared to Thomas. So we get the passage, starting in verse 24, it says that Thomas, one of the twelve called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails, and I place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. And although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, see my hand, put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. And Thomas said to my Lord, and my God. I want to the first mystery, the deity of Christ is his incarnation. The mystery of godliness. The second mystery is found in Colossians chapter 1. We'll begin reading verse 24. I'll try to read a little bit after this. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and my flesh, and filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions, for the sake of his body, that is the truth. Of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known. The mystery, hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints, to them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Many other passages of Scripture show us that Jesus Christ lives within those who trust Him for salvation. Another good one found in 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5, says, Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves, or do you not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you? Well, it's an astonishing truth. It's not easy to grasp. It's, it's a mystery. Jesus, through God's Holy Spirit, lives and dwells within every child of God. Well, we're like um, a glass of clay. Holding a, Christ, a priceless treasure, holding within us the spirit of Jesus Christ. And having his divine nature within us, it causes a radical change in our disposition. There's kind of a, a war that goes on within us because that old nature is still there. It doesn't go away. Those two natures, that old sinful nature and the new nature, they don't get along very well. They wrestle against each other, and because of that, we struggle with that. Until the day that we die. Well, isn't it amazing that after we get saved, you know, stuff that we used to love to do, we don't like it so much anymore? And the stuff about God that we had no interest in before, we love it now. We have Christ in us, and we have that new meaning. I've heard it said that it's kind of like having two dogs inside of you. And those dogs, they're fighting against each other. And the dog that we feed the most will become the stronger dog. You've probably heard that before, right? And that will be the dog that dominates how we think, that dominates how we feel, that dominates how we behave. And we see ourselves with the Word of God, uh, if we, you know, we're listening to Christian music, we hang out and we fellowship with our other brothers and sisters in Christ that are committed Christians. That's, that's feeding that new dog within us, that godly dog. And we can grow and we can become more like Christ. But if we see that old dog, that old sinful nature with the things of the world that are just making that old dog stronger and stronger, then we, of course, are not going to grow in Christ. We're just going to stay carnal and we're just going to stay worldly. It's a mystery to me that God would want to live inside of me, a sinner like me. But I'm thankful that he does. Because anything good that I do, 
a glory that can go to God. Because it's very difficult to do it. It's not anything that comes from my old nature. I want to tell you this morning that you can be transformed. Your life can completely change if you feel the right heart. So, we need to move on. The next mystery, the third mystery, that is found in Ephesians chapter 5. Let's begin starting verse 25, where it says that husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for it. And he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own place, but no one is and carries with it. Yes, it's quite best to church because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. Paul's quoting from Genesis chapter 2, where we find how uh, his wife Eve was created. In Genesis 2, it says that the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed up his place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. And the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of the man. Therefore, man, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. It might be easy to think that this passage back in Genesis chapter 2 only speaks about marriage. And it does talk about marriage, but there's also more. There's a mystery about the passage, something unknown at the time that it was written. And Paul wants to clear up that mystery. Paul wants us to know that there's more. But that passage back in Genesis chapter 2 also speaks about a mystery, a relationship between Christ and the church. As Adam and Eve became one flesh, we also are one with Christ. Ephesians 5 30 says that we are members of his body. And we could spend a lot of time on that one, but uh, we do need to move on. But before we do, I want to say something this morning. And I want to recap where we've been so far. In that first mystery, we saw that God became a man and that the Lord Jesus is fully God and fully man. In the second mystery, we saw that Christ lives in us, just as the Bible says in Galatians. It says in chapter 2, verse 20, that I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ that lives in me. And in this third mystery, we see that we are in Christ and we were part of his body. He's in us, we're in him. So I just want to say that as Christians, those of us that are truly born again, we can stop fretting about whether or not we've committed the unpardonable sin or we've somehow lost our salvation. We cannot lose it. Christ is in us, and we're in Christ. And since He is in us, we are sealed by the Holy Spirit of God as He promises us in the book of Ephesians where it says that in Him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in Him, you were sealed with the promise Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of His glory. We are sealed in His promise, and praise God, it's a guarantee. First John 5.13, it contains another wonderful promise where it says that I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. We can know that we have eternal life, not because of good things that we've done, because there's no good works that we can do to earn our salvation and to save ourselves. We can't boast about it. But instead, we can know because of what Jesus has done, we are hidden in Him, in His righteousness. His blood covers us, and we can know that we're saved. So, stop worrying about losing your salvation if you do worry about that. Instead, start working. Work 
back to salvation. That's what it says in Philippians chapter 2. Working not to earn it, because you can't earn it. Not working to keep it. But work hard for the Lord with a grateful heart. Work hard because of you have it. You have everlasting life. And now the next mystery, mystery number four. I think this one may be my favorite. It's found in First Corinthians chapter 15. The Bible says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. There's some churches that are above uh, the door going into the nursery. They will have a sign that says, We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Mystery number four is about the rapture of the church. Another great text about the rapture is found in First Thessalonians chapter four, where the Bible says that if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, then also we sleep in Jesus. Those who have already died, will God bring with Him? So this we say unto you by the word of the Lord that we which are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord shall not perceive them which are asleep. Those who are dead in Christ will go first, and we go immediately after. For the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. The rest of it is something God wants us to know about because He gives us so much hope. Comfort one another with these words. The Son, the Father of the Rapture, offers so much comfort, so much hope. Not every night, but really often, me and Bonnie were laying in bed and we talked about how maybe we'll both wake up in heaven. Not because one of us or both of us have died, but because we've gone up together. And the rapture. We say to each other, hope it's tonight. And we comfort each other that way because it could be. I mean, I, I would right now, I would have nothing more than to hear Jesus say, David, I'm up here. Before I even finish the sermon, you know, it could happen. Jesus will come for us at any moment, and that'll be such a great day. My wife, she looks forward to being reunited with her mom. That's in heaven right now. I want to see her again, too. Uh, that's the most, one of the most powerful things about death. The separation from our loved ones. How often think about how awful it would be for a bonding if I die first. What in the world would she do with that? What the people die with that? I'm joking, but seriously, if one of us were to go first, if one of us died first, the other would be so very sad. And so it's true for all of us, right? We're concerned about those we might leave behind if we were to die first. But in the rapture, we all collect together. There is no leaving a loved one behind if they're born again too. Oh, what a great day. What a great day. Oh, wouldn't it be great if the rapture happens while you're serving the Lord? Or maybe while you're in a prayer meeting, or maybe you're handing out a gospel to or maybe while teaching the Sunday school class or working in the children's department and the Lord comes during that moment or, or singing in the worship team. Oh, that'd be great. I'd like to be singing like we sang this morning. Uh, you're worthy of it all, Lord. And then, boom, rapture. And you're like, oh, hello, Lord. I'm just singing about you. <laughs> but I'm not having to face the pain of death and of the suffering. Oh, what a great day. And best of all, seeing Jesus and being with Him forever and ever and ever. I mentioned two kinds of people that have caught up with the Lord when the rapture takes place. He talks about those who died already and those who are still alive and caught up without ever having to die. Comfort one another with these words. The Son of the Son of the Rapture, I mean, it offers so much comfort, so much hope. Not for all the reasons that we just talked about, and many more. But I know that for others, 
maybe those that are not yet Christians, and sadly, even for some who are Christians, that maybe they're not living for the Lord. But then, the thought of facing Jesus immediately and unexpectedly at any moment can be quite disturbing. And I've often wondered, what would be more terrifying when the rapture happens? I, I thought maybe, you know, maybe you get on an airplane, you've got a Christian pilot and a Christian co-pilot, and suddenly they both just disappear while the planes are 30,000 feet. Nobody's there now to fly that plane. That would be so, so terrifying. But you know, I don't think about it. Maybe one of the worst places to be when the rapture happens would be being right here in church on a Sunday morning. I hope, I hope every one of you are truly born again. But there is a chance, and it's probably true in most churches, that some folks are not yet, not yet Christian, not yet saved. For a person who's not really a Christian, you know, sitting in a room full of saved people, when everybody suddenly just disappears at the same time, and leaving behind nothing but clouds and clothes, can't imagine the world. I think a person might lose their mind to something like that. Especially if they've heard about the rapture and then suddenly realize that they've just been left behind to endure those awful years since tribulation. If that's you this morning, don't be ready. You can get that unsettled to the point. And then when the rapture happens, we can pull up with all of us. Me and Bonnie, we were at Ivy last week. I gave a gospel track to an older black gentleman. Turns out he was a preacher. <laughs> We had a few good moments of fellowship, and when we left, I turned around in our way and I said, I don't see you again, I'll see you on the way up. What a blessed hope, what a blessed hope. When the rapture happens, that will end what is known as the times of the Gentiles. It will end the church age, and then the seven year tribulation period will begin. And that brings us to our next mystery, mystery number five, the mystery of lawlessness, the Antichrist. Looking in the book of Second Thessalonians, we see uh, chapter 2 and verse 1, now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, it's the second coming at the end of the tribulation period. And our being gathered together to him, that happens at the rapture right before the tribulation period begins. We ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one deceive you in any way. For that day, that second coming, will not come unless the rebellion comes first. And the man of lawlessness, the Antichrist, is revealed as the son of destruction who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. If you know your Bible, then you know that that takes place at the middle part of a seven-year tribulation. The Antichrist will do that at the three-and-a-half-year mark in the mid part of the church. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And you know... What is restraining him now? That's the Holy Spirit. So that he, the Antichrist, may be revealed in his time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he, the Holy Spirit, who now restrains, it will do so until the Holy Spirit is out of the way. And that nothing said, at the rapture. When, the, when we're taken out, the Holy Spirit lives in us. And if we go out in the rapture before the tribulation period, in the restraining presence of the Holy Spirit, that's also taken out when we go out. And then, after the Holy Spirit goes out with us at the rapture, the lawless one will be revealed during the tribulation, whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming at the end of the tribulation. The coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan, with all power and false signs and wonders. He can work signs and wonders too. And with all wicked deception to those who are perishing, because they refuse to love the truth, the gospel, and be saved. 
Paul told the road before, back in the book of 1 Thessalonians in chapter 4, he wrote about the return of Jesus back then. But the word is here in 2 Thessalonians, that implies that there's a difference between the second coming of Christ at the end of the tribulation and our gathering together at the rapture before the tribulation begins. There are uh, there are two parts of one great event. So then, after we're taken out, the tribulation begins, then the identity of the Holy Christ will be revealed. Now, I think that there's a very good chance that the Holy Christ is alive, walking around on planet Earth somewhere right now. Who is the Holy Christ? I have no idea. So, over the years, uh, many people have been accused of being the likely candidate for being the Antichrist, but those accusations, they all proved to be wrong. Uh, some suggestions were uh, Napoleon, uh, Hitler, Kissinger, or uh, even Obama. Well, I guess Obama could be correct, he's still alive. <laughs> but not too long ago, there was a guy named Mikhail Gorbachev, and he was thought maybe he was the Antichrist because he had this little square birthmark on his forehead that people thought was the mark of the beast. Who's the Antichrist? Well, that's a mystery for now. But he will be revealed in the tribulation. All right, it is time now that we better get off this detour and get back to the Romans chapter 11. And in Romans 11, that's where we find the last mystery that we want to talk about today in verse uh, 25 through 27. Let's be wise in your own sight. I don't want you to be unaware of this mystery, brother. But there's a partial hardening that's come upon Israel. There's many Jews that did believe, but Paul is one. Therefore, the hardening is only partial. Until the fullness of the Gentiles is coming, again, it will be full at the end of the church days when the rapture takes place. And in this way, all Israel will be saved if there is a remnant that will go into the millennium immediately after the second coming. As it is written, <coughs> The deliverer will come from Zion at the second coming. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob. Oh, yes, Jesus really will. And this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins in the millennium. Now, these mysteries that we just looked at, and they cover a few of some of the major doctrines in the Bible. In chapter 11, it does bring to close, you know, there's been three chapters we looked at that focus on Israel, chapters 9, 10, and 11. And you know, Romans over these last few weeks, I mean, up to this point, it's been so very interesting. And due to time constraints, there's just been so many things that we've had to, to look at and, and we've had to skip over. I mean, I was, I was talking with Ron uh, recently about the book of Romans. He mentioned something uh, where Paul presents his arguments, you know, like a, a prosecuting attorney uh, in a court of law. And Ron told me something I've never thought about before. It's in the uh, Verse 36, Romans 11, verse 36 in the doxology, it says that, Oh, he has given a gift to him that he might be repaid. And Ron pointed out that uh, it's referring to God as a righteous judge and that he cannot be bribed. He has to be bribed God. He has everything. He made everything. And nothing that we bribe God with, I mean, even if we could, uh, he's righteous. And it's sinless, and he would never take our bride. And you know something? We can never bribe God if we give the debt that we owe for our sin. As it says in Romans chapter 6, that there's a payment of sin, a payment is death. And there's only one payment that God will accept. There's nothing else we can bribe him with. He will only take one payment, and that payment is either paid by us, and we make that payment by dying and spending an eternity in hell. Our thanks be to God who made the payment for us if we will simply repent, humble ourselves, and turn to the Lord Jesus Christ and accept the payment that Jesus made by his dying on that cross. If you're not sure, if you think that has been paid, if you're not sure that you go to heaven when you die, I talk to one of our pastors, one of our deacons, Sunday school teachers, to contact me. Find out how you can have everlasting lives. Let's pray.
Oh, Father, thanks so much for your word, for the mysteries, for the God, the show us so many wonderful doctrines in the Bible. But we're thankful that you came, became a man, shed that blood on that cross to pay for our sin. And we're so excited to know that you're coming back first to us. And maybe there's a, a generation of us that will not have to ever die. And also you'll bring us to be with you forever, reunite us with our loved ones and with you, Lord. And we're so thankful for that. Lord, I pray if anyone here today is not not yet a Christian, that this will be the day of their salvation. And if there's anyone here today, Lord, that's far from you, they straight away, I pray, Lord, that they'll come back. Come back to you. Father, thank you for all you do. We do love you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.